Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. The 35th Council District in Brooklyn includes the neighborhoods of Clinton Hill, Fort Greene, Crown Heights, Prospect Heights, and bedford Stuy. It's a vibrant and very diverse district, and it's ably represented by the dynamic Lori Cumbo. And she's my guest today, so welcome. Thank you. So, it, tell me about the district. It is, it sounds to me as a, as a person from Manhattan, and knowing the different neighborhoods, it is a very diverse neighbor district. It's extremely diverse. It's very exciting. Although my colleagues in city council will hate me for saying this, I feel it's the epicenter of the borough of Brooklyn. I believe it's where everything is happening. It's where all of the districts converge for a multiple uh, amount of experiences from the culturals um, to our institutions of higher learning, to the Barclay Center, uh, to so many different um, opportunities for festivals and events such as Afropunk. Uh, this is like a really exciting neighborhood where yeah. so much is happening and I'm excited to represent it. It's known as the Cultural District of Brooklyn? I would say so. <laughs> now you have a museum there that you really, you developed. Correct. And uh, it's called? Mokata. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it stands for? The Museum <laughs> of Contemporary African Diaspora and Arts. Uh -huh. And it's situated within the Cultural District and it's an exciting opportunity for the museum to partner, to celebrate, to collaborate with many of the other institutions that are in the cultural district. And it's a, it's a unique district in the sense that um, there are more artists that live in Brooklyn than anywhere in the city of New York. And so this is a place where art is created, where art is inspired, where it's made, where it's exhibited. It's really becoming this place where people from all over the world want to see what's flourishing, growing, and happening in the borough. I looked at it on, online, and it looks like the most exciting place. I mean, I'd love to go and take some of those art classes and do some of the different things. So uh, people should look at it, and they can see the excitement. Sure. How did you get to do that? You're basically an artist. I mean, you're not basic. You are an artist. I am most certainly an <laughs> artist. Um, you're also a native-born Brooklyner. Born in Brooklyn. My parents came here. My father moved here in the 1940s. And we, Where did he come from? He came from North Carolina. Uh -huh. And he came uh, with my grandmother and my grandfather and his two brothers, and they established themselves um, in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn. And his life reads much like many African-American uh, young men at that time. He went to boys' high school. He grew up on Hancock Street. Uh, he served in the military uh, and then worked for many years uh, at off-track betting. Um, and my mother also came here at the age of 18 uh, on a scholarship to attend Juilliard. Mm. And her love was the arts as well. And she uh, has worked at Lincoln Center uh, for decades as a tour guide and also as what's known as a super in many of their operas. So she's currently in Aida and oh, La great. Boheme. Fun. <laughs> and she's been there and doing that for probably almost 40 years so now. So did you go to the opera? Oh, I love the opera. Yeah. Now, when I was younger, she dragged me kicking and screaming. <laughs> and now, as I'm 40, if she doesn't purchase or <laughs> gift me a ticket, I'm screaming. Upset. Yeah. Why didn't you get me a ticket to <laughs> Madame Butterfly? You knew I wanted to see that. So it's exciting because those were the experiences. My father deeply loves jazz music and has been a jazz connoisseur. Our whole apartment is just full of albums. And so that experience of hearing those albums and learning about John Coltrane and Randy Weston and Max Roach, that really created the foundation for so much of what I'm interested in today. So you went to school and you have a master's in fine arts. Correct. Right? So then we got that museum. <laughs> then we got the museum. And then we have other, you have other, you have all the major institutions. I have you? all of the major institutions yeah. and those that are not uh, in my district, I claim them also. <laughs> so, um, I have the Brooklyn Academy of Music, I have Theater for a New Audience, I have Brooklyn Museum. The Brooklyn Children's Museum is a little bit outside of my district, but I claim it. Um, the Brooklyn Historical Society, a little bit out my district, but I claim it. Uh, we have 651 Arts, we have the Mark Morris Dance Company, we have Urban Glass, we have Brick, which is an exciting space um, that has really become a dynamic gathering space for artists, uh, for creative experiences, cultural exchanges, and I'm very excited about their move. Uh, of course, my baby, Mokata, 
We have smaller institutions like the New York Writers Coalition, <laughs> uh, Creative Outlet Dance Company of Brooklyn. We have Ron Brown Evidence. We have uh, so many exciting <laughs> institutions, and I, I don't want to list them all because I'll get in a lot of trouble. Right. But they're you all also my have favorites. the Botanical Gardens. We have the Brooklyn Botanic yeah. Gardens, and yeah. we also have Prospect Park, and we have the Grand Army Plaza Library. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's exciting except come budget time, because you have all of these major institutions that need resources and funding. And of course, I always want to be, to, be, to be in a position to fund them and to support them at the highest level possible, because these cultural institutions are so important because they are what brings the diversity of the borough together in a way that nothing else can. This is, what, this is the place where community is created. This is your heart, isn't it? Of public service. Yes, it is. It's what yeah. inspired me to enter into yeah. government. Because it's so important to integrate all of this into people's lives. That's right. That's now, right. you do represent some neighborhoods that unless they had these organizations would not have any beauty in their lives. Is that true? I would say or that the cultural institutions have an opportunity such as, let's look at the Jewish Children's Museum. The Jewish Children's Museum is so fabulous because it has an opportunity to bring the diverse cultures of the Orthodox Jewish community, as well as with the Muslim community, as well as with African Americans and Latinos. It's a gathering place for people to learn about uh, Jewish culture. If that museum didn't exist, people would have difficulty knowing um, what Shabbos is. They would have difficulty celebrating or understanding uh, what a sukkah celebration yeah. is. So that institution creates that platform for those types of experiences to be had. And then they can go to an institution a few blocks away, like the Brooklyn Children's Museum, um, and experience culture with children of all races and nationalities. Do you think you have more different cultures than any other district? No. I, Almost. of course, always want to Except claim Jackson that, Heights. right? Yeah. There are a lot of parts in yeah. Queens that do have yeah. a level of diversity, but everybody's diversity is different. Mm. And, and how we quantify diversity um, is different everywhere you go. And so I would say that this district is diverse, not only racially, um, but also religiously, but also economically. We have multimillionaires and what people call the 1% living in the district alongside uh, so many communities that have not benefited from the growth and the development of Brooklyn that are uh, way below the poverty line. So it's the dynamics of integrating and working together and trying to uh, alleviate a lot of the challenges that having multi-million dollar uh, skyrocketing luxury condominiums right across the street from a public housing development that has seen little or no renovations um, in decades creates enormous challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and at times it can create levels of resentment. And so these are a lot of the issues that we have to work out. Um, and not just work out in terms of talking, but we have to work on creating the equality that will allow everyone to live harmoniously. How do you do that? That's a good question. Now, now that Brooklyn's become such the, the, the center of gentrification, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's where everybody wants to live now. That's right. Uh, what's going to happen to all the housing there? The prices go way up. We are certainly a victim of our own success. And I would say that, you know, there are 60,000 people that move into Brooklyn every year. Is that right? That is right. And so if we don't keep pace with the growth and development that's happening, um, rental costs are going to continue to skyrocket. Um, we're not going to have enough housing for everyone. And so those are the challenges that we have in terms of keeping pace. I would say that uh, right now we're in the throes of negotiating the mayor's housing plan. I was going to ask you, is that going to be helpful <laughs> in your district? <laughs> it will in the sense that um, the challenge with it has been that under the Bloomberg administration, there were so many rezonings that happened that did not force a serious element of affordable housing into the plan. Mm. And so with now with the mayor's uh, affordable housing plan and the zoning changes and, and those sorts of things, when any sort of rezoning is going to happen in a district, it's going to mandate that there is going to be an affordable housing um, component to it, which is really critical because, you know, so much of our city was already rezoned without that. Mm -hmm. And so luxury condominiums went up that didn't have any affordability as a part of it. This plan at its baseline is going to mandate 
that affordable housing be a component of it so that individuals will have an opportunity to live in their community, stay in their community, and to have it be affordable. The challenge that we're facing right now is we're trying to figure out how much affordability we're going to be able to have in this proposal and how deep will the affordability go. So that's pretty much what the, the debate is right now. And there's also, you have a lot of low rise, don't you? Oh, yes. Blocks. Mm -hmm. There's also a question, isn't there, about where you put it? how you build up in the middle of the block or other places. So you have to protect those neighborhoods. That's it right. Makes it even more complicated. A large part of the fight has been preserving um, the character of the neighborhood while recognizing at the same time that land is a premium. We certainly don't have a lot of land left um, in the city of New York. So density and or building up is really the solution. But at the same time, you do not want to destroy the character of Brooklyn, New York. And Brooklyn has always been known um, as, a, as a borough where our highest building was the Williamsburg savings bank clock right. tower <laughs> so that uh, landscape has been dramatically changed but at the same time we recognize that we do have to build up but at the same time we want to recognize that what makes Brooklyn so great are not the buildings it's really the character and the community and the dynamics of you know when I grew up in East Flatbush uh, so many of the older women just sitting outside in their chairs, just talking yeah, yeah. And, and crocheting and, and making sure that we got off the bus safely and that we had cookies and milk and, <laughs> and, 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 and lunch to eat when we got home. Like It was a sense of community where everyone really looked out for one another. And that's really the story of Brooklyn, is a place where people um, built community, uh, created safe environments for children. We respected our elders. They looked out for us. We looked out for them. And you don't want to dramatically destroy the character and the environment of a community because then Brooklyn won't be the dynamic place that we're all searching for. Mm -hmm. I kind of consider it like plastic surgery. Sometimes people make a little change <laughs> yeah, and yeah. you kind of like that was okay. And then, you know, and years later, sudden, you're like, you ruined thing. it. Yeah. <laughs> so we definitely don't want to make that the Brooklyn story because I believe that what makes Brooklyn so special is that there's something in the water and the ingredients and the energy <laughs> where dreams can come true, where the impossible becomes very possible, where new ideas, major films, if you look at you know, artists like Spike Lee and you look at uh, music stars like Barbara Streisand all the way to Biggie Smalls, or if you look at the story of Shirley Chisholm, if you look at the story of Dr. Una Clark, first Caribbean woman to run for a city council seat, Letitia James, our public advocate, mm -hmm. first woman to strong ever hold- Strong women. Strong women. And really dynamic men as well. You know, you look at Lenny Wilkins, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, the winningest coach um, in basketball history. When you look at all of these great individuals, um, Earl Graves, the creator of Black Enterprise Magazine. Oh, friend of mine from right? when he first started doing advance work wow. from a beam. And then he was hired partially on my recommendation to go work for Bobby Kennedy. Oh my and goodness. And he used to call me his rabbi. Anyway, oh, we'll I love start. It. <laughs> <laughs> we need to have a girlfriend. Yeah, we later. do have to. <laughs> Anyhow, so do you find that your inner soul and your vision is reflected by the other members in the council? Some, oh, that's a silly question. But do you find it in government? I mean, I, do you, isn't it a little frustrating that there's not as much vision as you would like to see? <laughs> Or I would say I, I, I didn't would, mean a leading question. No, I, I would say that the city council is the most dynamic place that I can imagine in the entire world. Uh, the diversity is so powerful. There's also a strong youthful energy um, mm -hmm. that has come forward in the city council that's matched with uh, more senior members who have the experience and are uh, providing a great level of history and understanding and bringing the two together as well as this diversity. I mean, the diversity is incredible. I have friends that I work with and colleagues that I would have never imagined that I would have worked with before. But I would say that what unites this council is that we are all so focused on equality. Everybody, however they define equality in this particular body recognizes that when we create the level of equality that we need, when everyone recognizes that they have the same opportunity to have their dreams come true, when they have the same opportunities to advance in our communities, when everybody feels that and knows that, then we feel like the harmony that is so needed, the balance that is needed, not only here but throughout the world, is so important because when we raise women up so that they are on the same 
uh, plateau as their male colleagues, then we know that there will be balance in the world that doesn't currently exist. That's so interesting. I was just thinking the difference between your being in the council and mine. I was in the first enlarged council. Mm, mm -hmm. So when you talk about age or the elders, right. the elders when I was there were 80, 80 years old, you know, okay. 75, 80 years old. Mm -hmm. And it was a struggle because we were the younger people. I mean, I was a younger person then. Mm -hmm. And we were the renegades, you know, we mm. kept going against what happened. So it, it's a whole interesting, that charter and then just the, I think it's campaign finance, right? Yes. And maybe even term limits. Although that's, it's a debate, still a debatable question, is it? Do you think? I think that with term limits, I believe that honestly, as a council member, you do need three terms yeah, in order to so be too. effective. Yeah. Um, you know, the first term, as they say, you're learning where the bathroom is, yeah. right? The second term, you're really able to put the projects um, that you campaigned on um, into being, right? Mm -hmm. And then in your third term, those projects actually come to fruition mm -hmm. and they're alive right. and they're flourishing. And you've and set working. them off and they're on to their next, their whole life on themselves. That's right. But yeah. it takes a very long time. Like, let's say, for example, in my district, I have Commodore Barry Park. Spectacular, wonderful park, but it needs millions of dollars in capital improvements. And as a council member, we receive about $5 million in capital um, to distribute every year, right? Mm -hmm. And you can put funding in different, as you know, mm -hmm. um, in different allocations every year, right? But in order for me to get Commodore Barry Park with the amount of money that it would take to do the renovations, okay. it would take about 10 years. And by the time you get to that 10 year mark, then the work begins. Yeah. And then you're out of office by that right. time. Yeah. So those are some of the challenges. But I do believe that it's important for there to be a change in leadership, to have new voices at the table, to bring up the next generation of leaders that have mm -hmm. new ideas, fresh ideas um, that have not been brought forward. And so it I think results, if you look at the national picture, mm -hmm. the paucity of, of candidates, especially in the Democratic Party, I mean, old. We don't, mm. we don't have the young talent. We're not developing the young talent That's in, right. in Washington. It's, it's too bad, right? That's right. Well, I, I, we have some exciting individuals I know in, yeah. um, in Brooklyn, New York. We have <laughs> Congresswoman Yvette Clark. We do. And we have Congressman uh, Hakeem Jeffries. Definitely. They are both rising stars and have really uh, put forward an exciting agenda and are really leading the way. Mm -hmm. But what I think is so powerful about their leadership is that they have been cultivating a next generation of leaders um, on state government as well as city council. And I think that that pipeline is what's going to change the dynamics mm -hmm. uh, all throughout. It's, I think that's true. That's very good. You're also the chair of the Women's Committee. Yes, I am. And it happens also to be Women's History. Th month. This is correct. <laughs> so what, is this, what does Women's History Month mean to you? Women's History Month. History, sorry. We've got all these new terminologies I know, I now, know. right? I never liked her, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> I think it's so exciting because we have to be able to put the, the goals of women forward during this month in a way that really ignites the entire year. So Women's History Month is really an opportunity to celebrate the work that was done the year before, but it's also to set a new agenda for what we want to accomplish or what was not quite completed. So to me, this is an exciting time because women such as you have laid a strong foundation and it's because of you that there are more women in politics than ever before. And so we want to continue that agenda of promoting more women to run. They say that the average man has to only be asked three times before he considers to make the decision to run for office. It takes a woman <laughs> approximately nine times. Oh, I know that to very be asked, well. Right? <laughs> yeah. So we kind it's of sometimes don't thing. always. Yeah. So we're pushing that agenda to make sure that more women step up to the plate. So and why do you think that? that? It, do you think that's the same old concept that we are in a little way have a higher standard of what you should be to be something? Do you know what I'm saying? I think totally. I think that we put on this 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 thinking cap that says I'm not quite qualified yeah. I don't quite have that experience I'm not really quite sure if I could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with right. some of the colleagues that I've seen whereas men kind of go into something saying I'm going to seize that opportunity and figure it out when and I get never there. worry about it and right. never, never worry about it not stressed about it yeah. but I think we're so and I think that might be the nurturing nature of us or the fact that we do give birth and that we think about things so I'm carefully. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that somebody of your generation understands what I'm talking about. <laughs> I always adopted a thing. I mean, I suddenly learned it someplace 
that a lot of people don't know what they're talking about, right? That's very true. <laughs> but if you look as if you know what you're talking about, it's 50% of the way at least. That's so right? true. And that women are not like that. That's right. That's right. We have to be very well versed in what, whatever we're doing. That's so true because we're judged at a higher level and a higher standard. And as soon as you open your mouth with that title, people are going to be watching to hear what yeah, you, you have, have to, to say. You and, really you know. have to speak in a loud voice. That's right. Like Shirley Tizzard. That's Tizzard. right. I mean, where did she get that loud voice? I think is <laughs> certainly God given. And you think of women like Bella Abzug. I mean, these women were trailblazers and they spoke loudly, passionately. And what's so incredible about them is that they left a legacy. Mm -hmm. And we're still talking about them today. We're still trying to figure them out today. Um, and, and those are some of the exciting things about Women's History Month. And we've made tremendous gains, but such a long way to go as it pertains to family paid leave. This is something mm -hmm. we have been as a nation, uh, one of four nations that does not have a mandated it's, family leave policy. We are so retarded when it comes to in that. any of the kind of family policies, right? Correct. I mean, I mean when we Anything, came in. Anything, health and everything. Health care. Yeah. When we came in, the idea of having five paid sick days was revolutionary. And so these were concepts that we put forward. Pay equity is still an issue that impacts us dramatically. And the fight for 15, uh, I was so proud to fight with, with so wage. many, right, to change that. Because if you, let, let's put it this way, if you wind up making the $15, you will still have difficulty even a qualifying for the affordable housing in the city of New York. Imagine if that didn't happen and you're making seven or eight dollars an hour. You don't stand a chance of being at living in to, New York City. Yeah. And those are the challenges that we face. And these are the challenges that often fall on the back of women. And when we're talking about so many other issues and gains that we have to make, also safety as it pertains to women in the city of New York. There has been a, a, a significant uptick um, as it pertains to sexual assault, as it pertains to rape, as it pertains to domestic violence. Uh, many of uh, are very aware of the incidents of slashings that have happened in the city of New York. And so the dynamics of safety for women is a cause that I champion. Um, it's a cause that I am demanding and requesting more funding. We had an additional almost 1,700 new police officers, and we want to have those particular officers have a particular mandate around issues of safety as it pertains to domestic violence, as it pertains to sexual assault. There's legislation that we're putting forward um, in terms of just recently we introduced a bill in terms of making sure that taxi cab drivers, um, livery, all of these have uh, for hire vehicles have training on sexual assault because they're receiving so many other types of trainings, mm. but they have to have a certain understanding of the ramifications um, of what sexual assault could mean for them as a driver, mm. because we need to come down and let them know that that type of behavior will not be tolerated in the city of New York, and that we wanna make sure that every woman feels safe when they step inside of a cab. Because for me, as a single woman that does not drive, um, a cab is my safety zone. Right. When it's late at night and I'm coming home from a meeting and it's midnight, I wanna know that when I call a cab, when I get in my Uber, that this is going to be a safe space for me. And every woman should feel that in the city of New York. We're introducing legislation so that individuals can not only call 911, but can also text 911. Because it's so important that this new feature will allow you to update images, um, video, in order to help uh, the, uh, the police department find the perpetrator or to find the location where you're at um, a lot easier than currently. And so these are technological, technological advances that will certainly make the city safer uh, for men, as well as importantly, women mm -hmm. who feel very vulnerable um, in the city of New York. It's really an incredible thing. I noticed on, <coughs> we're coming near the end, and oh, no. so you're going to have to come back again. But yes. I noticed that you were interested in what happens to you, young people who are in foster care and re and reach 18. That's right. These are people who've aged out of the foster care system. It's an enormous problem, isn't it? It's a huge challenge in terms of, and we're having a hearing on it actually today. Um, mm. What happens to our young people when they age out of foster care is horrible. They just um, left, right? Housing. Often they cannot secure housing. What are they going to do as far as their educational advancement? What are we going to do to make sure that they have all the mental health um, services that they had while they were um, in the foster care system? And 
and many of our young people are falling by the wayside in terms of they're not going on to receive advanced degrees. They're often found in our prison systems and our juvenile justice prison systems. All of these different sorts of things happen to our young people, and it's a, it's a tragedy um, as far as what we've understood. And, and we heard about this in terms of uh, this young woman in Brownsville. Uh, the situation that happened there where there was an alleged uh, gang rape that happened there. Uh, but yes. when you hear of this young woman's story in uh. terms of she had been in the foster care system since she was the age of two up until the age of 18 and what happened to her and the circumstances that she found herself in um, after becoming 18, um, the 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 challenge of the relationship that she's having with her father, yeah, her the challenge father that she found her, right. herself um, in that park that night. Mm -hmm. How many of our young people um, are languishing in this post system, mm -hmm. not with the appropriate services, not with the appropriate parental guidance? I've never really had that guidance. That's consistent right. Consistent guidance. Yeah. And that's and that's one yeah. of the great challenges yeah. and finding uh, placement for so many of our young people mm -hmm. and housing um, after they age out. It's All right, a great you're going to have to come back and yes. talk about this. I want to just talk about your website. Yes. I don't mean the government website. I mean your website, mm -hmm. which is lauricumbo.com. Com. Yes. It is the best website of any elected official I have ever seen. So I urge people to really go and look at it. It not only lists, it lists everything. You've got the five, you have five Distress, community yes. boards. It, it lists all the cultural, all the training, all the courses, anything that you want to know that's going on in that district. That's and right. it is, it should be an award. So I'm going to give you something. I don't Thank know. you. I look forward to it. And it's so indicative of your interest in all of these different things. Certainly. So you're enjoying yourself. I'm enjoying myself, and the greatest award you could give me is an invitation to come back. Okay, you got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>